I'm honored to be here and to participate in this wonderful symposium. I'd first like to thank the Staglin family and MRO for sponsoring some of the research I'm going to present today. And to be honest, after the scientists you've heard today, there's probably not a lot I can really add. So I'm going to still try to provide a different perspective in pink and in heels. So we'll see what you think. <laughs> so since this is a music festival, I was trying to figure out how to really introduce my research. And our research is really focused on depression, antidepressant efficacy. And I actually picked a number of different images from Picasso that were painted during his blue period in the early 1900s. And his blue period, as he has written about, uh, well, was written about him, was actually brought on by the fact that a very close friend of his committed suicide. Uh, the friend was in love with a woman. The love was not returned. He killed himself. And Picasso's paintings during this time took a very dark look. Lots of blues, feelings of melancholy, probably the most famous picture is the old guy in the, with the guitar, but they clearly bring out a feeling of sadness. And within art and depression, there's a lot of corollaries. We know not only in terms of painters, but singers, musicians, writers, they try to express their emotion of how they feel trying to convey that sort of sadness, if you will. This is another painting from Vincent van Gogh, just so shortly before he died, the old man in sorrow. And again, you can get this sort of feeling of really the sadness that goes into this condition. Major depression disorder is a very complex disease that's characterized by symptoms of anxiety, anhedonia, loss of appetite, sleep, feelings of worthlessness, or inappropriate guilt. Many, many different complex traits go into this. So to try to understand this with preclinical animal models is quite challenging. But it's something that's important to really advance the field in terms of mechanisms for future drug treatment. And that's really what my lab has worked on, is trying to understand mechanism of drug action. I just wanted to show one slide, and this is slightly different from Dr. Hyman's talk, but it presents the sort of same idea that major depressive disorder is the leading cause of disability currently in the US. And what's shown here is from 2005 to 2008, this is females and males. And with major depressive disorders, females are more afflicted than males for reasons we don't quite understand. But the point of this is really how consistent this rate is. It's not this up and down rate. It's actually quite consistent. On, I pulled this from the National Institute of Mental Health website. And on there, they have a lot of information about mental health, diseases, prevalence, current treatments. And one of the findings, which Dr. Hyman touched upon, was suicide. They list the top 15 causes of death from 2008, and suicide was number 10 at over 38,000 individuals, which is shocking, especially considering it's quite a bit more than homicides. As someone asked me once, does that mean you're more likely to hurt yourself than to someone to hurt you? It's an interesting take on the idea. Major depressive disorder is primarily treated currently by serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, things like Prozac. But they take generally weeks to work before you reach clinical efficacy, and that is really a problem for people that are seeking treatment. Our interest was piqued by some, a clinical observation that ketamine has a rapid antidepressant action. Ketamine is a drug that's been around for a long time. At very, very high doses, it can trigger psychosis. A little bit lower doses, it can be an analgesic. But this was at incredibly, incredibly low doses. They did an IV infusion for 40 minutes within patients that hadn't previously responded to antidepressant treatment. And within 40 minutes, they had a clinical finding of patients feeling better. And with that single dose, the effect lasted for more than a week. It's now been replicated in a couple of other studies. And in the last year, it's also been replicated in a trial with bipolar patients because bipolar patients do have aspects of major depressive disorder. So this finding has many different implications past just major depressive disorder. One very obvious one is suicide. If someone presents in an emergency room, suicidal, could this be used as opposed to hospitalizing someone? So we were quite taken with this. The fact that this has actually a clinical component to it, that we know it works clinically, allows us to do something somewhat unique, and that is to try and understand the mechanism to see if we can actually figure out what's going on. So as I said, we do this in preclinical animal models. We first replicated some work that had previously been done with Husseini Manji at the National Institute of Mental Health, just to show in animal models, does ketamine work? 
Ketamine is believed is an NMDA receptor antagonist, so it targets glutamate receptors, different from typical Prozac-type compounds. So we just ask, in these animal models that can predict a compound like Prozac, can ketamine actually work? This um, is just some quick data showing that, yes, in some animal models, we could get an antidepressant effect. Not in all animal models, but in some. And so if we simply gave an animal a preference for sucrose versus water, the idea is that if you want the sort of sucrose, the good feeling, or not, and if you had ketamine, the animals that did preferred sucrose. If we look at their immobility, if we take the animals and we put them in a beaker of water and measure how much time they swim, we know if you give them a compound like Prozac, they actually will spend much less time swimming. They are much, much, they'll be less immobile, is how it's actually graphed here. So they'll actually spend much more time mobile. We don't know why this predicts how antidepressants work. It just does. And we also look at novelty suppressed feeding, just how much time an animal takes in a new environment to eat. Just different ways to try and show that ketamine actually could produce an antidepressant effect in animal models to start dissecting out the mechanism. So the first thing we did is ketamine is believed to work through targeting NMDA receptors. Well, is it through targeting these glutamate receptors that you could actually get an antidepressant response? Moreover, if you use different NMDA receptor antagonists, different classes like non-competitive or use competitive or competitive, do you get the same effect? So what we did is we just took different groups of animals and we gave them either ketamine or different classes of NMDA receptors and simply tested them at either 30 minutes for the fast-acting effect, three hours, 24 hours, or one week later. And each time point represented different groups of animals so that there was no behavioral habituation. What we found with ketamine is that when we gave the animals ketamine, within 30 minutes they had a significant decrease in immobility, suggestive of an antidepressant response. And that ketamine not only worked at 30 minutes, but worked through for more than a week after receiving the drug. CPP and MK-01 could both trigger a very fast-acting effect that persisted for some point but was gone by one week. We used all these drugs at extremely low doses so that there wouldn't be any complications of learning and memory impairments, locomotor activities, and these drugs all have very short half-lives. So what this data suggested to us is that targeting the NMDA receptor, blocking it, appeared to be sufficient to produce an antidepressant response, but based on the half-life of the compounds, you didn't have to persistently block it. Clearly, there were some sort of long-term changes that were going on to produce this long-term effects. My lab has spent quite a bit of time looking at a molecule called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's a growth factor in the brain that's been linked to traditional antidepressant responses. So we took, simply took animals that lacked BDNF and we gave them ketamine to see is ketamine downstream of the NMDA receptor blocking activity. And what we found is in black are the knockouts and in white are the controls. If animals are given vehicle, there's no change in immobility. If you give a wild-type animal ketamine, again, you get the significant decrease in immobility suggestive of an antidepressant response that's blocked by ketamine, that's blocked by the loss of BDNF. We see the same effect at 24 hours, and we can also see this with MK-01, suggesting that BDNF, this growth factor, is downstream of NMDA receptor block and appears to be critical for the antidepressant response. We looked simply, if we gave ketamine or MK-01, does it change the expression of the gene? Is BDNF turned on so that there's more made, either at the message or protein level? And what we found was that when we gave ketamine or MK-01 and then looked in the brain, there was no change in BDNF mRNA expression, but there was a very robust increase in BDNF protein within 30 minutes of administration, which was rather surprising to us. And that's somewhat unusual. What we did is we asked, if this really is due to new BDNF protein synthesis, then we should be able to block the effect. So we simply took drugs that would block protein synthesis, and what we found is that if you gave ketamine, again, to wild-type animals, you got an antidepressant response, but if ketamine was present with anisomycin to block protein synthesis, to block this new BDNF protein increase, you did not see the antidepressant response. We saw this at different time points as well. So it suggested that you're blocking the NMDA receptors, BDNF is required for the action by actually upregulating this protein. But the question is, what now? That's nice, but that's not really mechanistic per se. And this was really where the challenge became. Our results had suggested that there has to be some long-term effect going on. And glutamate is well characterized to produce long-term changes, especially learning and memory type changes. 
through increasing protein synthesis, but it's all through activation of those receptors. In terms of behavior and blocking this receptor for these types of effects, there was nothing that we could find in the literature. We looked at a number of different ways to try and answer this question, and we were really at, sort of at a loss. And then we turned to some very basic research that was focused on looking at synaptic transmission. Within the brain, there's two forms of synaptic transmission. There's evoked or action potential generated transmission, which is very important for learning and memory. But there's also background neurotransmission, just sort of tonic neurotransmission that's in your brain. And it's been known about for a long time. And for the most part, it's been sort of neglected because we don't really know what it means. However, from some very recent work within the last couple of years, there's been some data to suggest that if you target these NMDA receptors, if you block them, they have very specific effects on spontaneous transmission that can increase very quickly protein synthesis and change the, the function of that neuron. So we wondered if these in vitro findings were actually what was happening in vivo with ketamine. So we did some work to actually test that. We looked to see if, in fact, by blocking a particular kinase, did we actually see a decrease in phosphorylation? It's very technical, but the bottom line was, was yes. If we gave animals ketamine or MK to one, we saw a decrease in this sort of fluorescence, suggesting that there was this EEF2 activation. And if we gave drugs that have primarily been used for in vitro manipulation to block this kinase, we think that the NMDA receptor block is inhibiting this kinase that triggers the downstream effect. If we just take these drugs, put them in animals, they very quickly produce this very rapid increase in BDNF protein translation, two different drugs. They also trigger this decrease in phosphorylation. And if we look at animal models, I'm just going to show you again the four swim test. These animals are with either Rodolin or NH125, the EF2 kinase inhibitor, produce significant decreases in immobility at 30 minutes, 24 hours, or one week after administration suggesting that targeting this pathway is sufficient to produce an antidepressant response. And just to tie it together, if we take these kinase inhibitors and put them in the BDNF knockout, you can see that they work in wild-type animals but not in BDNF knockouts, kind of providing the link that it is through the specific pathway that we're seeing the effect. So this is our hypothesis. We think that normally, in terms of this tonic neurotransmission, that when the NMDA receptors are activated, they trigger the activation of this kinase that triggers phosphorylation of a downstream molecule that shuts off protein translation. However, when ketamine is present, it actually inhibits this kinase, triggering this dephosphorylation, resulting in an upregulation of BDNF protein and downstream effects. What I showed you is that if we just block this kinase independent of ketamine, we can trigger the same pathway. So our data has a couple of implications, or at least ideas to think about. One is, could you target EF2 kinase inhibitors as fast-acting antidepressants? Another is, since our data suggests that it's actually blocking spontaneous, a sort of tonic neuron transmission and not evoked, could you set up some type of assay to screen for compounds that could specifically block spontaneous versus evoked transmission, and maybe going after a very broad-based effect? And the last idea I'm going to leave you with is just more of a provocative idea. As I started off, I said we study depression, antidepressant efficacy, and we sort of link them together. Really, we study antidepressant efficacy, and we hope it tells us something about depression. It may, it may not. Within the field, people a lot of times will say, since this is our best approach, it tells us something about the disease. If our data, looking at antidepressant efficacy, tells us anything about the disease, what could that be? Well, could it put forth the idea that something like depression is caused by differences in just basal neurotransmission, basal tonic levels of something like glutamate. I mean, no one wants to be depressed, so could this be something to maybe look at in a different way? So with that, I'm going to stop and just acknowledge the people that really were responsible for the work, and thank you.